Hi there, I'm Gary Smith, your host of Psychedelic Alex, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics. Today on the show, I have two guests, Andy Bunksha and Liz Mason. Uh, they both come from the fascinating world of cannabis finance, and they're here today to talk with you all about cryptocurrency and black market. Mm. Any other topics we want to cover today? I don't know. Let's see where the day takes us. That's fantastic. And that, folks, is Liz Mason, not Andy, making sure you could tell the difference <laughs> between the two of them. Uh, anyway, Liz is a CPA and hails from Nevada. She is also a partner in High Rock Accounting. Partner, correct? Am I misstating I'm that? I'm the founder a of founder. High Rock Accounting. Indeed. So you're a co-owner as well. Yeah, and I actually hail from New York originally, but uh, I went to college in Nevada. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. Definitely so. an interesting uh, change in culture, I would say. And when, when did you leave New York? I left New York uh, when I was eight years old and moved up to Connecticut, lived there for a few years, about eight, and then moved out to Reno, Nevada in my last year of high school. Fascinating. Where'd you go to high school? I went to a small private school called Sage Ridge School. In Reno? In Reno. I was the first graduating class. There were five of us, and it forced me to stay in high school the entire time, which was the goal of my father. So I'm a Reno high grad. I, I never went, heard of Sage Ridge. Yeah, well, because it didn't exist, you know, back in your I'm day. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I, so I have known you for years, and I did not know you also went to Reno? I did for my last uh, two years, Reno High. Go oh. Huskies. And uh, let me let me stop being rude and introduce the audience to you as well. This is Andy Bunksha, my friend and fellow attorney, uh, who also uh, traverses the cannabis world. And Andy, why don't you give our folks at home a, a little snapshot of your bio as well, if you would. Well, thanks for having me here today, Gary. I'm, I'm not happy to see Liz, but everybody else I'm happy to see. <laughs> no, Liz is a good colleague and friend of mine also. Sometimes. Sometimes. That depends. Although it's really interesting that Gary gave you the floor to give your full bio and <laughs> skipped me, you know. Well, he yeah. stole the turn from White you. White man so. privilege. It's fine. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> well, we're coming right back to you, so don't feel special. <laughs> I am special. Thank you. She is special. Uh, so, Gary, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, that was great. Anyway, Liz, yeah. back to you. <laughs> Go, Perfect. Liz. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So the relevant point here is I'm also a founder of Rebel Rock Accounting, where we focus on the cannabis industry. And I've been following this industry for years and been involved in various ways and learned as much as I could. And, you know, as a tech nerd, I have definitely dug in far too much into cryptocurrencies and the dark web and understanding how it all works and why it all works. Okay. And I'm, uh, I'm delighted to support Liz and the Rubble Rock team as their, uh, as their general counsel. Indeed. We love, we love each other. We just joke. And uh, I'm, uh, I've been uh, working in the cannabis space for seven years. Before that, I was uh, uh, with large companies in the gambling and uh, public uh, safety enforcement industries. Cool. And despite that resume, he's actually a good person. <laughs> now, for, for, the, for the benefit of the <laughs> folks at home who... Um, we're going to be strangers to them. They haven't met us yet. So let's make sure that, that they know we're not just schmucks with a camera here. <laughs> but we are. <laughs> but we are, But we are in fact, schmucks with a camera. Uh, but Humility. I, I, 
why don't you tell folks how you first got into cannabis as a profession and uh, give a little bit of description of, of what you specifically do in that profession. Yeah, absolutely. So originally founded High Rock Accounting, focusing very heavily on technology companies and working with them to get products to market, which was extraordinarily interesting and worked a lot with investors and in various types of companies. And we had some cannabis ancillary companies we were working with and we were servicing them anywhere from bookkeeper to CFO, helping them get financing, figuring out what they should do, go through seed round to series A to series B to selling to private equity to taking the company public. And these ancillary cannabis companies started popping up working on either technology for the cannabis industry or services for the cannabis industry. And we started realizing that there was a true need for true finance professionals in this area that that understand the tech that's available and understand how to utilize these things and integrate them in a way that helps cannabis companies grow in a way that will get them funded and let them grow, right? And so we stepped into true cannabis-touching, flower-touching companies a few years back with the founding of Rebel Rock. And to really impress the folks at home, can you give, without breaching any confidences, of course, a, a description of like the size of your clients, the dollar volumes that they deal with, um, that sort of thing? Yeah, so we work with multiple multi-state operators that are dealing with, you know, big dollar amounts um, and, and able to take take things international, potentially, with a few of them. And, um, you know, I think we just got, what, a, a seven-figure deal on the table today, Andy? Nine, nine figure. <laughs> nine-figure deal on the table today. So. Sorry. No, you're good. I've been up since 5 a.m., so numbers are hard. It's surprising considering I'm, I'm in the finance space. But Well, we're going to be doing uh, nothing but math problems for the rest of the oh, show. Oh, fuck I this, Mal. Okay. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for the folks at home, as you can tell, Liz does some pretty heavy accounting in the cannabis world. Uh, and as Andy mentioned a moment ago, he works with Liz as general counsel to her accounting company. But Andy, you're, you're also a cannabis consultant as well as an attorney. So uh, again, from the perspective of, of uh, sharing with our audience what your street cred is, uh, give a little description, what, what you do, what your clients look like, what kind of size they are, that sort of a thing. Thanks, Gary. So uh, I'm a board member, counsel, or uh, board advisor for uh, multi-state operators and uh, vertical operators in uh, multiple states, Canada, Mexico. Uh, I also represent uh, capital in uh, India uh, Qatar and Singapore. Uh, my clients are in 26 states in the U.S., um, all forms of cannabis companies and ancillary companies, from processors, cultivators, dispensaries, to groups that provide uh, ancillary support, LED lighting, um, management software solutions, and accounting solutions uh, across, the, uh, across the space. Uh, it's a wonderful industry, and I'm happy to be a small part of it. And, and you're doing a bunch of M&A work for the cannabis industry as well. Yes, very actively. I, uh, I'm a corporate lawyer by training, and uh, my emphasis is on finding commercial uh, financing and capital resources for these emerging enterprises in the private uh, cannabis space primarily. I'm not that very involved at the public level, and that's intentional. And um, today we're going to be talking about the, the travails and challenges of just money, money in general <laughs> in this space. And I'm hoping we can leverage your experience with cannabis in the real world, which is happening right now, mm -hmm. and maybe try to project or hypothecate how this might translate or look in a uh, future world where other plant medicines might come online. Can I go first on this? Absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. So, my, the reason I got into cannabis uh, seven years ago, I had a lot of experience doing um, deals with uh, uh, Indian tribes around the country in the gambling industry. I negotiated probably 40 different uh, tribal uh, gambling agreements around the United States, and I was approached by a high-quality cannabis group to see if I could figure out a way to convince the right Indian tribe to, because of their sovereign status, to provide capital and banking solutions for cannabis because cannabis is federally illegal and no traditional U.S. banks in touch so far 
uh, the cannabis industry. So my very first initiation into cannabis was to talk to a lot of my tribal contacts to see if they would be willing to bridge that gap. Fascinating. Did you accomplish it? I failed terribly, <laughs> but it was seven years tried. ago. And, and it was, was seven years ago. I was yeah. going to comment on that because my experience has been that most of the tribes, at least here in Arizona, I can't speak for other tribes around the country, but definitely here in Arizona, most of the tribes were, were very anti-cannabis. They didn't want it. Yes. Um, they were concerned about it being another exacerbation of an already existing substance abuse problem. Very fair. And they wanted to steer clear of it. Was, was that your experience as well? Yeah. With alcoholism and drug abuse pervasive at a higher level, at a, tri at a tribal level than, than U.S. generally, they were worried about cannabis seven years ago. Yes. Things are slowly changing. Uh, I, I have seen that as well. And, and the tribes right now, uh, for those of you watching, in 2018, the U.S. government had finally opened up to hemp, uh, which if you're not familiar with the distinction, it is still cannabis. It just has very low levels of THC. And the federal government finally got behind allowing hemp to be grown in the United States once again. And if you didn't know this, hemp used to be grown in the United States. In fact, it was one of the original, if not the original crops grown here when the colonies were first founded. Didn't George Washington grow Oh, up? my God, yes. Uh, not only George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they both owned vast hemp plantations. Why don't they talk about that in Hamilton? Uh, I haven't seen Hamilton. I don't know. <laughs> I understand they sing a lot. They do. We so should then probably, there's probably do this podcast a, and song. There's probably a lot of marijuana in <laughs> Hamilton then, but no that. hemp. Um, but kidding aside, yes, if you go, for example, to visit Thomas Jefferson's old homestead, which sounds really tiny, it's massive, uh, plantation, let's call it what it is, mm -hmm. called Monticello in Virginia, you can actually see original artwork of slaves, Thomas Jefferson's slaves, working in the hemp fields, harvesting Thomas Jefferson's hemp. And they even have ledgers from, from the harvest. So you can go and see all of Jefferson's finances, which, by the way, he died penniless. He was an abysmal businessman. Jefferson. Jefferson, yes. He, he was regarded as one of the most money foolish of the founders. He was born into great wealth and privilege and died pretty poor. And they talked about that in Hamilton. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> well, apparently uh, you all need to go see Hamilton now, and Liz will be happy to get you two for tickets. Fantastic. Yes. Fantastic play. Was it good? Oh, man. Amazing. You see it in New York? I actually did not. I saw it on TV when it was released a few weeks ago. I want to watch oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, did, it, did yeah mm -hmm. it did come out a few Highly weeks ago. It did come out a few weeks ago. Highly recommend watching that. Cool. All right. <laughs> anyway, so as we were saying, um, hemp is okay again under USDA guidelines. You just need to live in a state that's got a, a federal government approved hemp program. And if you do, hemp is a freely traded commodity once again. So, What about the testing of it? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a topic for a different show on a different day. <laughs> so enough. Liz is alluding to uh, a very sore subject that I guess I can foreshadow since you mentioned it, testing. So testing is obviously something of concern to everybody who would be consuming these products. You want to know that they're not coated in toxins or poisons or molds. And there has been some level of resistance from the industry to want to test and also resistance to uh, encourage or honor existing testing regulations. And that's been a real bugaboo, if I can use that word. I think you can use whatever word you want. It's your podcast. It is my podcast. Is podcast. We're, we're going to go with bugaboo. That's it's a good one. It's a, <laughs> I like it. That's today's safe word, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so we're hypothecating today on, on, on these problems of a future psychedelics world as we're watching a cannabis world reopen. So that being said, uh, uh, folks, you tell me what are the financial travails that plague cannabis today? Well, I mean, Andy brought up a great one, banking being a serious issue still to this day where federally chartered banks can't touch the money and anybody doing credit card transactions can't touch the money. So you're looking at very small state chartered banks that frequently have deposit limits or extreme fees to be able to handle the funds for cannabis companies. I mean, you're looking at five to 10 percent off the top just for banking fees which is insane when you start thinking about what that looks like at a, at a grand scale inside of the U.S. And then, of course, the banks will only take a, a certain number of cannabis clients. And so if they max out their portfolio of cannabis clients, they're done. They won't take on a new one. And so you have to go try and find another state chartered bank 
to work with and it's difficult and it's difficult to run money across state lines as well. Talk about like armored truck fees and people with guns escorting cash. It's insane. And I know, you know, your experience with the, well, also, also that, yeah. <laughs> but it happens, right? <laughs> if we're talking about the current state of reality, this is yes. what's happening and I'm not endorsing it or saying that it is legal, but it is happening. Um, and if you start looking at the mass amounts of cash handling, think about the amount that just slowly disappears, right? The other side of the coin, if you can't pay those ridiculous fees, everybody has to pay their employees in cash, has to pay their taxes in cash, has to pay their electrical fees in cash. So these small risk-inclined banks can really do very well if they're willing to take, take on the risk. Sure. which causes all kinds of issues. And, and let us uh, let me lay some premise down just to make sure everybody that's listening understands why you're saying what you're saying. So federal law deems all of these Schedule One drugs, of which cannabis is a Schedule One drug, or really technically marijuana if we're being precise, and there are definitional differences. Um, so pedantic. He's right, though. He hey, is, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I'm a lawyer. I get paid by the word. True. Uh, that's how the briefcase <laughs> got invented, by the way. We're going to sidebar for a moment here. The briefcase Bugaboo. got invented. Safe so word. Bugaboo. Bugaboo. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear my briefcase story? I want to hear it. Okay. The, no, no joke. The briefcase story got invented because lawyers got paid by the page. So they would write these really long briefs, and they got so damn big, they had to create it's cases depressing. to carry them around. True story. I'm sleeping through the story. Sorry. Anyway, we're done with that story. Oh, okay. I'm back awake. What's Good happening? Lord. We're going to invite Liz back a lot. <laughs> anyway. Never again. Um, <laughs> so the problem is this. Schedule one drugs are considered to be federally illegal, and therefore the act of trade in them is subsequently illegal, which also means that banks who touch the money are considered to be participants in that illegal enterprise and the federally chartered banks are naturally scared to death because the last thing they want is to have a charter revoked or to have uh, executives criminally charged or or worse and understand when you're just simply taking money from a cannabis enterprise even if you're just operating as a normal bank taking normal deposits a prosecutor is going to look at that and consider you to be engaging in money laundering and trafficking and facilitating those activities. And you're on equal footing with the guy who's actually running the dispensary. Here's how we get even further into the uh, Alice in Wonderland hole, uh, the rabbit hole. Um, so Canada, everything relating to cannabis is completely legal, including all forms of banking. So Canadian enterprises can get traditional financing. Uh, cannabis enterprises at 2% or 1% or 3% anywhere in Canada with any of their wonderful banks that also bank often across the U.S. and all types of industries, uh, BMO, Bank of Montreal, all kinds of Canadian banks do quite well in the United States. If they try to provide the same or similar services in the United States, they're breaking international laws by engaging in a federally unlawful uh, transaction. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of cannabis companies try to avoid that or angle around it by going public in Canada or having assets in Canada, and then subtly or not so subtly bringing their assets over the U.S. border illegally. Uh, and there are a whole set of issues at, at that level as well. Mm. Um, yes, and it gets further complicated by the, the corporate structures that they put on this to actually do it. Well said. Yeah. Tell you what, this, this tells me we definitely need to do a Canadian stock exchange show. Oh, yeah. So, sure. So... I'm inviting, I'm inviting you both back <laughs> now so we can have that oh, conversation. Oh, I got invited back. Already? It's amazing. You're a permanent fixture. Gary, <laughs> Ixnay on the list gate. <laughs> <laughs> bugaboo, bugaboo. <laughs> We're going to see if viewers write in. We'll let them choose. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but some of you might be asking, so how does the federal government know if somebody goes and deposits cannabis money, right? Well, any deposit in the U.S. over $10,000 requires reporting to the federal government, regardless if it's at a state charter to federally chartered bank. Any bank, even credit unions, have to report that to the government, which means that they report who's depositing it, what company it's for, why, what account it's going into. And so it's very clear and very easy to track where that money's coming from. Sure. And, and to be clearer than that, it's not just reporting it. The report is called a suspicious activity report. Mm -hmm. 
So you're already kind of deemed to be a little nefarious just because you're merely dealing in cash. Right. And, and I'll tell you, I, I once had a personal experience with that. I was buying a used car and the guy wanted literal cash from me. So I went to pull cash out of my bank account and it was slightly more than 10000 I had to fill out one of these suspicious yep. activity reports I have and explain myself times. to the banker <laughs> yep. just to get my own money. And I was buying a car. Yeah. Um, so this is a daily event for cannabis businesses. Every time yep. they go to a bank to make a deposit, they're having to fill this paperwork. Out. And they there are, do. Yeah, there are certain states that, so most states at this point, um, five or six years into general medical marijuana legalization around the United States, most states, there are a handful of very small state chartered banks or credit unions that will actually take on compliant cannabis enterprises. There are still mm -hmm. states that won't. And yet all of these states that won't, don't have any banking relationships, there's still cannabis going on and the cannabis companies need to get LED lights and inventory tracking systems and HVAC for their grows and nutrients for their soils and all of the groups. A million the little things that cost. Right. Mm -hmm. All of these ancillary groups, if they hit above a $10,000 threshold, have to report a Form 8300 with the IRS. Yep. And it's a real struggle. And, uh, you know, it's still an issue, even though cannabis is everywhere in the U.S. now. Well, basically. and it's hard to even deposit that amount of money as a service company, mm -hmm. right? I don't touch flour, never have. If I went to the bank and decided I was going to deposit a couple hundred thousand dollars, it's a, it's a big deal. You have to have a relationship with a banker for them even to accept your cash. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Um, but on top of that, I don't know if you guys read about this, but when the IRS realized that all of this, these cannabis companies were going to have to pay their tax bills, they did not accept cash for tax bills at IRS offices prior to two years ago when they hired a consulting firm to teach them how to accept cash and put in proper processes and controls and You're systems kidding. to take the amount of cash they were getting for tax bills. Other Before that, there was no way for people to actually pay their tax bills in cash. Now, here's interesting. Historically, we're talking go back two, 300 years. During the colonial period, when hemp was being grown, you could pay your taxes with hemp. No joke. You could <laughs> That's fantastic bring, irony. You could bring bales of <laughs> hemp and pay your tax with weed. Uh, boy, how we, we should go back to that system. We, we might. We well, listen. If it all goes to hell in a rocket, we're going to be back in a barter system anyway. I mean, we're close to that. We're like unless a we world turn over right the now. cryptocurrency. Yeah. So what a great segue. So that <laughs> is uh, <laughs> digital currency has been nibbling at the edges of cannabis for the last five years. And why is that? Because if you can. Figure out a way to use a non-U.S. based currency, and Liz is the expert on this more so than I am. Um, it solves all your problems with the secured access to, you know, transactional amounts. Liz, you want to jump in? Yeah. So uh, the idea of cryptocurrency is very interesting. So if you take it and you break it down, cryptocurrency is based on the technology. Thank you.